today we are going to be talking about water quality. So the first question I have for you guys is just what is pollution? I know we've all heard of that word before, but we're going to be talking about it a lot today. It's kind of an umbrella term for tons of really bad things that are happening to our ocean and not only to our ocean, but just to our environment in general. So all pollution is, is something that is in our environment that should not be there and it's harming our natural world. All right, so now we're gonna talk about three different specific types of pollution uh, and the most common ones that you see. And if you want to guys, you can get out this worksheet right here. So this is worksheet number one. Uh, we're gonna go over this together and talk about our three different types of pollution. So the three types of pollution that are most common are air pollution and then point source and non-point source pollution. So they're kind of easy to determine what types of pollution are which because it almost says it in the name. So if we're thinking about air pollution, it's probably pollution that's going to be up in the sky or up in the air. Uh, point source pollution, just means that you can point out where that type of pollution is coming from. So for an example of this, let's just say we are at a boat dock or a boat marina where you fill up on gas to get uh, gas for your boat. And then all of a sudden you start driving away in your boat from the marina and you realize that you guys didn't close your gas tank or there's a hole in your gas tank and all of a sudden gas is pouring out of your boat. Well, if we're looking at the boat and this gas leak, you can point out where this gas is coming from. So that is point source pollution. It means we know exactly where this pollution is coming from. An example of non point source pollution is exactly like what's in the name again it means you cannot point out where this pollution is coming from an example of this might be let's say that you're walking along the street you're drinking a can of coke or a pop and you decide you're too lazy you can't find a trash can and you throw this can on the street well this can might blow into the ocean it might go down your storm drain uh, it might end up somewhere completely different and let's say it does end up in the ocean and then another person goes out to play in the ocean one day and they see your can floating nearby you can't figure out where that can came from maybe it came from uh, the street maybe it came from someone's neighborhood maybe it came from the beach but you cannot point out where that pollution is from so again just to review we have point source pollution non-point source pollution and air pollution so for this activity, all you guys need to do is that there's a few different scenarios on here, and I'm gonna go over this with you, but we have to identify what type of pollution is happening in these photos. So for this, it says circle the objects causing air pollution, star the objects causing point source pollution, and put a square around the objects causing non-point source pollution. And then when this video is over, feel free to color this in if you would like as well. So let's start with this factory. So it was just telling you guys that factories and manufacturers use tons of energy and tons of fossil fuels and expel tons of gas from their uh, processing plants. So if there's tons of gas in the air and different pollution in the air, then this is going to be air pollution. So you're gonna to wanna to circle the factory and fossil fuels, just like that. All right, so let's move on. So the next one says, star the objects causing point source pollution. So on here, there's two main things that I see as point source pollution. The first one is going to be this marina right here. Just like I was saying, a lot of times there's oil spills or gas leaks. You can tell exactly where that pollution is coming from. So that's going to be a point source pollution. Also on this page, we see this outfall pipe. Um, we're gonna talk about outfall pipes in a little bit, but essentially they are pipes that connect the ocean to 
our land and to septic tanks and to our wastewater and to even our storm drains. And so if that sounds a little bit confusing, all you need to know for right now is anything that goes into some of these pipes, so like our, our septic or wastewater treatment um, pipes or our, like I said, our storm drain pipes, those all come through outfall pipes. And so you're going to want to star the outfall pipes and the marina or gas station, just like this. Because you can point out exactly where that pollution is coming from. So they're point source pollution. Finally, we're going to put a square around our objects that are non point source pollution. So this means we don't really know where they're coming from. And so for this one, we are going to put a square around littering, around the farming or nutrient runoff. And all that means, so a lot of times in really, really big farms or places where they're growing um, tons of crops or have tons of animals, they use a lot of nutrients and fertilizers to make sure that their plants are growing really big and that all of their livestock is being fed properly. And a lot of times those nutrients might not be so good for our water. And if there's a big storm or if they uh, are using a lot of, of water to also nourish their plants, a lot of these nutrients and fertilizers can kind of escape and go into our waterways as well. So you're gonna put a square around farming and nutrient runoff. And then you're also going to put a square around septic tanks. So your final product should look like this. Um, and if some of those words are confusing to you, like I know not everyone knows what a septic tank is, don't worry, we are going to talk about that at the very end of the lesson. And then I have kind of a cool activity uh, at the very, very end that will explain these types of pollution more. So again, don't feel bad if you don't know what some of these things are, they will be explained in a little bit. All right, now we're gonna talk about something called marine debris. And what that means is it's anything that wasn't intended to be in the ocean, but now it's in the ocean. And they're all solid objects. So there is so much marine debris in our world right now. It is pretty crazy. So here are just some examples. So this bucket has tons of marine debris in it. There's fishing line and a rope. There's an aluminum cannon here, cigarette butts, a plastic bag at the very bottom. This right here are tons of cigarette butts. This is about 1,700 cigarette butts. Uh, and this was picked up on a local beach and it only took about an hour to get this many cigarette butts. So these are another example of what could have been in the ocean uh, that would have been classified as marine debris. So marine debris is really, really bad. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. But first, let's do another um, poll question. So what is an example of marine debris? fishing line, an oil spill, or fossil fuels. Right, really good job. Most of you guys got that correct, but don't worry if you didn't. The answer was fishing line. And the reason the other two aren't marine debris necessarily is because they're liquid or gas products. The fishing line is that solid material that's not supposed to be in our ocean. So always think of it as a solid material. Uh, and fishing line is actually probably one of the number one debris items that we can find just because there's a lot of people that are a little irresponsible sometimes when they fish and they have a lot of extra things on their boat from fishing and a lot of times it comes in the water. So like nets and fishing line, all that kind of stuff. And obviously these things, since they're not supposed to be there, they are really bad for our ocean for so many reasons. So the first one is called wildlife entanglement. So here's a picture you guys can see of a turtle a turtle that is covered in a fishing net. And so sometimes animals do get trapped in fishing nets and line and rope, and it causes them to not be able to live out their daily lives, and it's really, really stressful for them. So that's wildlife entanglement. Uh, another thing that's kind of related to that is um, ingestion. So a lot of times animals will actually eat things that are not intended to be eaten. So I know a lot of people know that turtles eat jellyfish. Well, jellyfish look very similar to plastic bags, and a lot of times turtles will eat plastic bags. 
there is a really large bird that I think you guys talked about with Miss Dora in the seabird lesson called an albatross. And these birds are really, really big and they're pelagic species, which just means that they live their entire lives on the water. And one of the things they do is eat red squid. And there was a scientist and a photographer that went out to study these birds because a lot of them were dying all of a sudden. And they realized that in their stomachs, all of these birds had tons of red bottle caps and red wrappers confusing them with the red squid that they were normally eating. So it's very important that we don't throw them away because a lot of animals are trying to eat this plastic. Another reason is habitat damage. A lot of times if we do have big nets or big pieces of plastic or whatever the marine debris may be, it might sit on coral reefs or might sit and rip up seagrass and as we know and as we've talked about, these ecosystems are really, really fragile. So if we have a huge net on a huge patch of coral reef, that coral might be at risk of dying because one, it can't get the sunlight it needs. And two, it's a very fragile animal in general. So it might be cutting that animal up or making it really sick. And so a lot of times habitat gets damaged as well. Another reason is for boater safety. If there's huge pieces of plastic that are not supposed to be in the ocean, I mean, here in Key West, after Hurricane Irma, there was tons of debris in the water, even things as big as doors and refrigerators and chairs. Even a few of my students said that they saw Christmas trees just floating around in the ocean. And when we have huge things like that and you're trying to boat around, a lot of times you might hit a piece of marine debris in shallow water and damage your boat. So it's even bad for us as well. And finally, marine debris does affect tourism down here. So we have over 3 million tourists that come here a year. And a lot of times these tourists wanna come to sit on our beautiful beaches and to snorkel in our crystal clear water. And if there's trash and debris in the water and debris on our beaches and cigarette butts on our beaches, do you think people are going to want to sit and hang out in a trash-filled beach? Probably not. There is so, so much, many things that are made out of plastic and even more than you probably even realize because we use it so much. I mean, around me right now, there's markers that are made out of plastic. My, uh, I have a few cups around here. These are made out of plastic. Part of my scissors are made out of plastic, my sunglasses are, even parts of my headphones are made out of plastic. There's so many different things. And the thing about this is that plastic has become a real, really big problem for our oceans. There is actually more plastic in our ocean right now than stars in the galaxy. Can you even imagine how many pieces of plastic that is? And the real problem with this is that plastic never, ever, ever disappears. It doesn't decompose. It doesn't get smaller or like disappear. It will be on our planet Earth almost forever. So just think about that, that every single time we're producing these pieces of plastic, they're probably going to end up on our ocean and they are going to be there for forever. Um, and I just want to talk to you guys very briefly about the history of plastic. So why did plastic even exist if it's so bad for our ocean? Well, about 100 years ago, plastic was first made in 1907. And it's made out of gas and oil and petroleum. And the cool thing about plastic and why it became so popular is because, one, it's extremely strong, but also it can come in all different shapes and sizes and forms for every single activity you could think of. So plastic bags are great for holding your snacks and they're really flexible and loose. Grocery bags, same thing, they're really flexible. But then you have things like Tupperware, which are really, really strong and can hold a ton of your, of your stuff. And also then you have plastic silverware and plastic plates, which are really great for eating on the go or trying to eat really quickly, not having to clean up your mess and to throw these dishes away. And so plastic, yes, it's very convenient but it is really, really bad for our environment. So I want you guys to get out worksheet two. So this is what worksheet two looks like. There's a bunch of different items on here and you have to guess how long they last in the environment for. All right, so for this worksheet, I'm not gonna do all of them with you, but as always, the answers are online. 
But I do want to go over a few of these things. So it just says, guess how long it takes for each item to decompose. Fill in the blanks with the word bank below. Some words can be used more than once and color them in when you're done. So let's just do the first few together. So the first one is an aluminum can. And this one definitely takes quite a bit to decompose. Uh, this one's gonna be about 200 to 500 years. So the aluminum can is 200 to 500 years. So this is made out of metal. The next one is a paper bag. So paper bags definitely don't take as long to decompose as tin or metal or anything of that sort. So the paper bag still takes about one month to decompose. So the aluminum can, you can write 200 to 500 years. The paper bag, you can write one month in that spot right there. The next one is a diaper. So a lot of people don't know this, but diapers are made out of plastic. I know that there's like the old cloth ones and those are a little bit different, but just any normal diaper you would get at the, the store are made out of plastic. And if you guys can remember, does plastic ever disappear from Earth? No, plastic does not leave our Earth, which means that the diaper is gonna be in our environment forever. So that one is forever. Forever. All right, the last one I wanna do with you is let's do the cigarette butt. So all these guys right here are cigarette butts. Remember that we found these just right near the shore of our ocean. So if we didn't pick them up, that's probably where they would have gone. Um, and a lot of the cigarette is made up of paper, but a tiny portion of cigarettes is actually made out of plastic. So since cigarettes are partially made out of plastic, how long do you think that part is going to be around in our environment? The answer is forever. So you can write forever down for that one as well. So now let's move on. So I said that plastic never disappears. It never disintegrates or it's going to be on our earth forever. Well, this is because plastic is really, really strong and it's made out of very strong chemicals that don't allow it to decompose or anything of that sort. But something that plastic can do that makes it even worse is that if you have a cup like this, like a plastic cup, no, it will never disintegrate. But plastic does weaken if there is sunlight and that will make the plastic break up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. So yes, this will never disappear, but this cup in a hundred years from now might be thousands of tiny pieces of plastic. And every single time it breaks down or it gets weaker, really toxic chemicals also go out into the environment. So this is called microplastics. And microplastics is kind of a new term just to describe a piece of plastic that is less than five millimeters in size. So if you guys can think of a millimeter, they're really, really small. So it's just pieces of plastics that are really, really small. And microplastics, yes, they're smaller than that cup I just showed you or a plastic bag, but we're starting to find that they are actually almost worse for our ocean than bigger pieces of plastic. And like I said, it's because they're giving off toxic chemicals every single time they're breaking down. And also scientists are finding that they think fish are eating these microplastics thinking that they're food. And this is not good for many reasons. Obviously plastic shouldn't be eaten. So these fish are getting sicker and sicker and also they're starting to debate whether or not humans are eating this plastic as well. And this is because of a word called bioaccumulation. So here's a photo right here that I have. Well, there's a problem with this because these guys right here might be plankton, but also these microplastics are getting confused for the plankton. So if we look at this all over again, and these are all microplastics. Well, shrimp's eating the microplastics. That snapper is eating the shrimp. That big grouper is eating the snapper. And if the grouper is eating all of these things, that means that that grouper is probably gonna have plastic inside it. 
And if we are eating fish like snapper and grouper, that means that we are probably maybe eating plastic or at least eating fish that had plastic in them at one point. So again, that's called bioaccumulation and it's really not good for us and not good for our environment as well. So uh, next I wanna talk to you guys about um, gyres again. So I know that you talked with Dora about gyres and it's just circular motions of currents. Well, there's something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that is kind of by Hawaii and then also, and Asia, it's kind of where those two continents meet. Hold on, let me see if I can get it. All right, so see where that yellow circle is? So that's where the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is. So like I said, it's kind of circling by the west coast of North America and the east coast of Asia. And that is a particular gyre that has the largest accumulation of garbage and plastics in the ocean. It actually has about 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic circling that gyre. Now, this garbage patch has caused a ton of different problems. And again, one of the biggest problems it has is that a lot of this garbage is actually microplastics. So there's been tons of different scientists and different research to see how we can get all this plastic out, but it's really, really hard because it's coming from all different areas. So like we said, that gyre is continuing to make the ocean current go in a circular motion. Well, as plastic kind of floats through the water, it gets trapped in this circular motion, almost like a whirlpool. And that is becoming a really big problem because all this trash is accumulating to one different area. All right, so now we are going on to a completely different topic. I wanna briefly talk to you guys about what happens when we have too many nutrients in the water. So when you think of the word nutrients, I think of vitamins and staying healthy and being you know, active and having tons of good things in my body. Well, nutrients can actually be a bad thing as well. And it's when we just have way too many of them. So let's take a farm, for example, again. Let's say that there's a farm and they have tons of different crops and in order to grow those crops, they need to put fertilizer on them and give them a ton of nutrients in order to make them grow and to be able to sell all of their products. And this is a really good thing for a farm but just like how we were saying things run off into the water, if there is a really big storm and tons of rain comes and picks up all of those nutrients and all of that fertilizer and dumps it into the water, things happen that aren't so good and it really affects our, once again, our marine life. So let's say that we have tons of fertilizer and tons of nutrients in the water. This is going to all of a sudden cause huge algae blooms. So have you guys ever heard, um, I know people in Florida probably have because it's a big problem like red tide or blue green algae. A lot of this is scientists are thinking is coming potentially from just so many extra nut nutrients and fertilizers in the water. So when this happens, then all of a sudden tons of algae grows. And I actually have a picture of what this can look like sometimes. So when you have nutrients, it's going to grow so much algae that that algae is going to cover, um, I can see it now, is going to cover surfaces of tons of different um, bodies of water. Once this happens, all plants die at some point. And so when these come and the plants start dying and decomposing, all of a sudden it sucks out all of the oxygen in the water, like all of it. And so, as you know, fish and marine mammals, they need oxygen to survive. And so when this happens, there's no more oxygen in the water, and then fish and other animals can start to get really sick and die. Um, and the whole process of this, of the fertilizer going into the water, plants blooming, the plants decomposing, and oxygen being taken out is called eutrophication. So can you guys all say eutrophication? Cool. And then, the effect of eutrophication, so all of that water that's depleted of oxygen, is called a dead zone. All right, the last thing I want to talk about that's damaging and bad for our ocean is what happens to our stormwater. So stormwater 
just means, so have you guys ever heard of a stormwater drain? So if you go out into your community or on the sidewalk, you might see these little grates. And when it starts to rain or when there's a thunderstorm, all the water goes into these, these drains and uh, kind of picks up anything else in its tracks. So let's say that it's raining one day and the rain's trickling down and on your roof there was bird poop so the rain picked up the bird poop and then the rain keeps trickling down and in your driveway there was tons of gas that was dripping out of your car so it picked up the gas and then your friend decided that they didn't really feel like throwing away their soda can so they dumped their soda can on the road and then the rain picked up the soda can well, that bird poop and that gas and that soda can is all going to go into our storm drains. They go in the storm drain and all of that water actually leads to our ocean and to waterways. So if you don't live near the ocean, but you have storm drains, most likely a lot of that stuff is going to lead to river systems, lakes, streams, ponds. It's going to dump into these things and just make our water more polluted. Now. There's a few different ways that we can make sure that our storm drains might be a little bit better in helping combat all this pollution and litter. So a few things that we can do is create better guards or better grates. So if you know what like a grate is, it's basically just a device that helps separate liquids from solids. So sometimes in a few different cities, they might have grates on their storm drains. So as these waters are coming in, uh, all of the litter gets filtered out and doesn't end up in our drains. But a, a problem with this is that gas and liquids can still go in. So your car gas can still go in, different things of that sort. Another thing and a cool thing that Reef Relief does is we actually stencil our storm drains with these signs. So can you guys read that? So those signs, they say no dumping drains to ocean and they're all red and splotchy because we spray paint those signs onto our drains down here. We have about a thousand different storm drains and it just helps remind our community that if you are thinking about littering, you might not want to because it's all going to end up in our ocean. The other thing I briefly wanted to talk about that kind of affects this as well is different sewage systems. Now, I know this is not a fun topic. No one wants to talk about our wastewater. And all that means is when you go to the bathroom and you flush your toilet, that water is going somewhere, which is pretty gross. And a, a long time ago in Key West, about 20 years ago or so, and still today in many other cities, we have something called, called a septic tank. And all that means is it just stores all of that wastewater underground. Now the main problem with Key West having these is our ground is made out of a material called limestone. Now I don't know if you guys remember, but we talked about limestone way back when in our intro to coral lessons. And I can show you some limestone. This is a piece of coral, but it's made out of the same thing. Limestone has tons of holes in it. So if we're using limestone to hold our septic tanks and all of our wastewater in it, it's probably not gonna do a very good job at holding all of that in. So a lot of our wastewater was leaking, it was going into our, our ocean, and it was making our near shore water really polluted. And unfortunately, septic tanks are not gone in other places in the world. Like I said, 20 years ago, they switched a ton of Key West septic tanks to just advanced wastewater systems. So instead of going to the septic tank, they go to a wastewater treatment plant and it gets treated and treated and treated until the water is really healthy and not, it doesn't have any waste in it anymore, which is a really good thing. And it's super exciting that we have that, but other places do not. For example, in Miami and Palm Beach County and a lot of South East Florida, there are actually nine of these outfall pipes that are still allowing wastewater to go directly into our ocean. Now they kind of clean it, but it's nowhere near as clean as it needs to be to going back into our ocean because it's definitely polluting our waters. Uh, actually in these outfall pipes, these nine outfall pipes, 188 million gallons of this partially treated wastewater is going into our oceans every single day. So 
hopefully we can find a solution for this in the future and hopefully maybe more people can uh, switch to advanced wastewater systems because it's just really really bad and it makes our water extremely polluted especially not only for fish but in near shore waters where we like to swim and kayak and boat and enjoy this environment and it's getting kind of polluted from these from these things right, so the very last thing i have for you guys is just what are some things we can do to make sure that our water quality is healthy and i know we talk about this a lot but it's just so important that a lot of people do this so one Try not to litter. And if there is litter and if it's safe enough to pick up, make sure you just pick up trash for other people. It's important that it doesn't go into our ocean. Also, maybe start measuring water quality. If you live by a lake or a river or off the coast of an ocean or anything of that sort, buy some cheaper water quality equipment stuff and track how well your water quality is in that area. Um, also, you can volunteer for Reef Relief or for other environmental organizations in our world. There's tons of different places that will have volunteers do big beach cleanups, neighborhood cleanups, um, anything where there's trash in the ground. Get a group of people together and just see how much trash you can pick up. And finally, places also might have people volunteer to spray paint these storm drain stencils that I was talking about, especially in Key West. If you're ever interested in spraying these on our drains, you're more than welcome to come and help with that as well. And then finally, per usual, always just make sure that you're educating other people of the um, state our ocean is in and what we can do to make it better. Because the more people we educate, uh, the better off we will be.